Well, today we're uh, about to embark on a journey of the family tree of Jesus. And I have a question. How many of you, at some point or another, have gone on one of those ancestry websites? You, you started to fill out the family tree, and you begin to dive in, and you connect. As I understand it, the way it works is you connect with other people who maybe have similar connections. And over time, you hear stories about extended relatives. And sometimes some of these stories seem to me a little far-fetched, but... Have you ever, in the process of doing that, discovered there was a branch of the family tree that you wished you could find pruning shears and just cut off, right? <laughs> it happens. It happens in everyone's family tree. There's some scandal involved or there's some issue and you kind of just want to look the other way. And I, one of the amusements I have for my friends who have done those ancestry things, and this is all my friends who've done this, at some point or another, they make a discovery that they are related to somebody important or famous, right? And uh, any of you related to somebody important or famous? Very good. Well, I'm not, but most people will claim something, you know, a royalty or whatever. And one of my friends brought up to my attention that they were related to some English noble person. And I, I asked the question, I said, how come all my friends who look into their family tree end up finding somebody important or famous and nobody's married to the, the bar fly or the village idiot? And there's a lot more of them than there are noble people. There's a lot more average, everyday people in family trees. And, and what we're going to do over the coming weeks together is we're going to look at just a few branches of the family tree of Jesus that contain a little bit of a scandal. Those kind of stories that maybe, just maybe, make us uncomfortable. And they're incidentally stories of people found in the Bible that Jesus are in his family tree that um, if we were curating our family tree, we might edit out and focus the attention elsewhere. But in the Gospel of Matthew in particular, he includes some infamous, that means famous for the wrong reason, kind of people. And so we're going to start with a, a patriarch, if you will, a man named Judah. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, I'd invite you to find Genesis 38. And we're going to spend time rolling through Genesis 38. It starts this way. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man uh, of Adullam named Hiram. Now that name and those places are going to come back up in a moment. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. And apparently, he liked the look of her because it said he married her and he made love to her. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. And she conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. And she gave birth still to another son and named him Shelah. It was a Kezib that she gave birth to him. Now, one thing we have to just get out of the way as we dive into this is we are not dealing with a story is told of a people long, long ago, as in some sort of fairy tale. These are real people who lived in a real place in a real time. That if we could reach out and touch the hem of Judah's garment, we would feel the rough wool. If we sat around the campfire on which dinner was being prepared, we would smell the roasted meat and feel the heat. These are real people. And why this matters is because this story is full of great tragedy. There's death, there's disappointment, there's deception. There's great drama in the story. And one of the things that can happen when we dive into stories in the Bible, and this is by accident, is that when we get into the stories, we sort of detach emotionally. And this is one of the stories that just compels us to feel deeply because it's gruesome at times, it's dark at times, it's painful at times. These people were going through it. So with that in mind, let's start not in Genesis 38, but let's look back a bit. And if you have the scriptures, you can look there, but I'm just gonna summarize what's in Genesis 37. See, um, Judah is a, a man who's part of a family. And uh, I like to see charts. I found this chart. You can find this on the internet. I like this one just because it's clear, it's crisp, but it also gives a birth order of things. 
So there's Abraham, and he's married to Sarah. And after a long, long time, they have a kid, Isaac. And Isaac, he marries Rebekah, a girl from the old country. And once they are together for quite some time, they have birth to two sons. What's the name of the sons? One's on the board, Jacob, and the other one's called Esau. And Jacob, Jacob really, uh, or Isaac really loves which son? Esau. And Rebekah loves which son? Jacob, you know? So Esau is a man's man. They get into, they're into hunting together and doing manly things. And, and Jacob's around the tent with Rebecca collecting Martha Stewart recipes. She connects with him and dad connects. But of course, there's a turn of events and Jacob ends up the son of promise. And Jacob ends up with two wives and their servants, all of which produce heirs for him. And what I like about this chart is it gives us a little bit of a snapshot very quickly of the birth order. So if we look at it, Leah, who's the older sister, which one is Jacob's favorite wife, by the way? For those of you who know, it's Rachel all the way to the right, the younger sister. Leah ends up by trickery, Jacob's first wife. But she is also blessed with his first four boys. So we have Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. Now, right now, I know you're going, hey, when do we get to the part of Genesis 38? I'm getting to it. And then, of course, there's a bunch of other kids. It's not till 11 and 12 that Benjamin or Joseph and Benjamin are born, and then Rachel passes away. But Jacob has his favorite son. Now, Jacob was a man noted in the Bible for his solitary trust and faith in God. But Jacob is not a man known in the Bible for being a great husband or a great dad. If you ever are in a used bookstore and you find a book on marriage and parenting written by Jacob, just pass it on by. He didn't have any wisdom to share, only recklessness, maybe foolishness, but that's not why he's admired. He's not admired for those things. So he has a favorite son. Who's Jacob's favorite son? Joseph. Now, in traditional families in the ancient world, the firstborn son would be the family leader. That was just how it went. But in Jacob's family, there's an odd dynamic. So, what happens is while Reuben is the oldest, Reuben is never dad's favorite. Because earlier in Genesis, Reuben has a romantic tryst with none other than Bilhah, who is the mother of Dan and Naphtali. The family drama must be fantastic. And so Reuben hooks up with Bilhah in a carnal kind of way. And his dad, being the great dad he is, just resents his son but does nothing about this. But what it does is it moves Reuben off of the spot of the first son. Well, then there's two other sons here, Simeon and Levi. And as you see down at the very bottom, they all have a sister, Dinah. Well, Simeon and Levi, when there's this tragic and awful story where Dinah is sexually assaulted by a man from Shechem. But the man from Shechem is in love with her. She's not in love with him, evidently but he is in love with her. And after he has assaulted her, now he wants to take her as a wife. So the boys concoct a plan, dad, there's no way uncircumcised fellows can marry Dinah. And not only does her husband need to get circumcised, everybody in the village needs to get circumcised. And so every fella, I, this one is one of the great wild stories in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis, you can find it, where the men of the village agree to all have a surgical procedure done with minimal antiseptic and uh, minimal anesthesia. So the fact that there was a town hall meeting where they all agreed to this so that they could merge with Jacob's family tells you how much they wanted to merge with Jacob's family. Once the men from Shechem did this, then Simeon and Levi went into town while the fellows all had ice packs in sensitive areas and killed them all. Once again, father of the year, Jacob, does nothing, but he does say, you've made us stink in this community. We gotta move on. These people are gonna kill us. So the first three boys are kind of knocked out of contention for dad's favorite slot. This leaves Judah, son number four, 
in direct competition with son number 11, Joseph. And why I bring all this up is because just prior to the events I read, Judah steps in because his brother Joseph, the chief competitor for dad's affection and leadership of the family, is sitting in a cistern all bloody and beat up. And there's a thought, maybe we should just kill him and get him out of the way. And Judah, of all things, steps in and says, let's not do that. That would be a little much. We all hate him. Let's just get rid of him. And it just so happens Ishmaelite traders are moving along a trade route. And I brought a map. You may see at the very bottom, this map brought to you by Terry Fakes. <laughs> you know, for all of you who love Terry and his maps, every time a map comes up in our church, there's always some reference to Terry. And I always think anyone who's brand new to the church won't get the joke. But the rest of us think it's hilarious. He didn't give me this map. I did find it, but I'm giving him credit for maps in general because I, I view him as the inventor of maps. So this map, which is also on the little handout I gave you that's at the doors as well, this little map kind of shows you the green highlighted, which unfortunately your map's black and white. The green highlight is the Ishmaelite traders. This whole Genesis 37 goes down right around Dothan. And so the Ishmaelite traders come through and Judah goes, let's not kill him, let's make a dollar off of him. Let's fake his sage's death, tell dad he's dead, and let's move on. That all goes down in Genesis 37. Joseph's torn up, lamb-blooded clothes are presented to poor Jacob and he's told your boy is no more. And he does the math on the blood and the torn up garments and says, an animal ate him. And they all say, yes. And all of that precedes what we just read. About that time, Judah goes down to a particular area, which is in this little boxed area down here, Timna, Adullam, Chesbim, all to the west of the Dead Sea right there. And so, this, this is the context in which all of this goes down. This is the narrative that has to be playing in the back of Judah's mind the whole time. And imagine, some of us have been involved in family discord. And family discord always plays in the back of your mind like a bad VHS tape, doesn't it? It's hard to get it out. And sometimes it, it's from years and years past. And Judah moves away from all of it. But you can move away from a place, but that doesn't mean that place has moved away from you. And so he moves into a new territory. And he meets a girl. She has no name in the Bible. She's never named in the Bible. That doesn't mean she didn't have a name. That doesn't mean the Lord didn't know her name. It just means that her name is not presented to us because in this chapter, there's only going to be one woman's name revealed. And it's the name to remember. But we're not to her name yet. And so Judah meets a girl, and she's a Canaanite girl. That is, she is not of the tribe. Now, this is interesting because Abraham really wanted his son to marry a girl from the family tribal unit, and Jacob, his parents, wanted him to marry a girl from the family tribal unit and sent her back. There were options, but Judah doesn't pursue one of the options, which kind of tells us how far off track the family that started with Abraham was moving. Well, let's move into the next bit of the text. Judah got a wife for Ur. He's grown up now, his firstborn, and her name, the only female name in the whole chapter is Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Now, it's interesting is that Ur in English, this is lost on us, but in the old Hebrew in which this was first uh, spoken and written, Ur is his name and Re is wicked. So there would even be a, a sort of poetic play on the terms of Ur and Re, meaning this guy, Ur doesn't mean wicked, but Re means wicked. And I'm speaking it just as the ancient Hebrews did. No, I'm kidding. I have no idea. Nobody living knows what they, no one knows, no one knows. But they generally know from inference of how things are pronounced this day that there was this sound in it. Now here is, uh, to me, I wish that the scriptures would be a little more clear at times, don't you? All we're told is that Ur was so wicked, the Lord put him to death. Now that's an accomplishment. If you have a LinkedIn profile, 
That's something you put on there. Now, you'll be dead, but you'll be able to say, God killed me. Now, this is why this is interesting, because this is the first individual in the entirety of the Bible who was killed directly by God, who just said God wiped him out. Now, God had wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah, but that was a whole village. That took a whole village to bring down that kind of, of uh, response. But this, Ur did something bad. Now, this is, again, we just talked about this. This is in the context of brothers who are in such family discord. They beat their brother almost to death, stage his, stage his death, turn over bloody garments to his dad. So they lie to dad, and then they sell their brother into slavery. And none of that, none of that has brought down the hammer. Whatever Ur did, it was bad. So you can use your imagination and assume what it was. Well, the story goes on. Then Judah said to Onan, now this is where the story gets a little strange. Says to uh, his uh, brother or to his second son, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. And uh, this is about the time when people, as they read the Old Testament, say things like, thank God the laws have changed. I think the world of my in-laws. But marrying in like that, that is not something that sounds good, does it? And when you're, if you're used to this story, you just are used to this story. So it just sort of rolls together and you don't kind of go, ooh. But this is actually not a moment where we should judge their culture. It's one where we should step back and try to understand why they did this. You see, um, the, the way that marriages were to intertwine families was to produce strength for an entire community. But also, when a woman joined in with a family, now she was part of that family. She was under the protection and the provision of that family. But if in this case, she died, her husband died and there were no children, then she would be a vulnerable woman if she was kicked out of the family because now well, she's a widow. And so the family was to keep her in the family unit, but not just as somebody who lived within the compound, but somebody who had rights. Now, there were laws that were codified, that were verbalized, that later got codified, but there were actually specific laws that governed these sort of things. Because this wasn't, um, this wasn't erotic. This wasn't romantic. In fact, people today oftentimes marry for one of those reasons. They're very attracted to that person and they want to be with that person. It's not wrong reason, but, but that's a, a reason to get married that's quite temporary because anyone who's ever you know, found themselves in marriage for that reason and that reason only realizes, well, that, that fades over time. So does romance. Those of you who are newly married, romance doesn't fade at all. It stays the same. The rest of us know the truth. But <laughs> in our culture, it's hard to wrap our minds around this. It reminds me of something I heard uh, Ruth Graham say. This is, of course, uh, the wife of Billy Graham, the great evangelist of the 20th century. She had grown up a missionary kid in China, and she acknowledged that growing up in that environment, she noted that many uh, marriages in that place in that time were arranged. And her observation, having grown up in some of those early years in those cultures, she said, the marriages, they started out cold because the couple didn't know each other, but they warmed up over time, they got hot. And then she moved to the United States. And she realized in the Western world, marriages start out really hot and grow cold. And so, not always, of course, but, but this is the risk when romance is the driver. Well, people did not get married for romantic reasons, no matter what the historic romance novels tell us. That's not how it happened. One family would look over at the next family and say, it looks like we kind of could uh, merge forces and we could actually be friends. And if we uh, swapped kids, uh, we'd be better friends. And then the assets would kind of come together and we could watch the same family sheep and shear the same family sheep. And this would make us all stronger. But when a son died, leaving a young widow, what do you do with the young widow? And so that whole part of the ancient world had some of the same laws. Here's a few of them. 
This is a Hittite law. If a man has a wife and the man dies, his brother shall take his widow as his wife. If the brother dies, his father shall take her. So this is where it takes a little turn. If the first son dies, she marries the second son. And if the second son dies, she marries her father-in-law. Yeah, exactly. There's some faint chuckling in the crowd right now because that doesn't sound great, but let's keep in mind, what is this for? It's to preserve the social fabric of the community. It's to make sure that she is tended to and taken care of. This is for her protection as well as the care of the entire village. Well, that's a Hittite law, which would have been a law that was popular in that region. Here is a Middle Assyrian law code. This is circa 1450 to 1250 BC, somewhere in there. If a woman, and it's almost the same law, just a little more wordy. If a woman is still living in her father's house, but her husband has died, as long as she has sons, she may live in whichever of their houses she chooses, so she can be with her sons. If she does not have a son, her father and law is to give her whichever of his his other sons he prefers or if he wants he may give her as a spouse to her father-in-law in In other words he can marry her if he wants to if both her husband and her father-in-law are dead and she has no sons she is a legal widow she may go wherever she wants which by the way didn't very well work out for her because there weren't a lot of options for women in that community Now in Deuteronomy, which is after this story, Deuteronomy would have been a book that was written after the time of Judah, of course. We have the law in the Bible now. And here's what Deuteronomy says. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother. So even though biological father will have this biological son, it will technically be a nephew. And the first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, and it goes on, and it's actually worth reading because basically there is an option. If the guy says, look, she's irksome. I can't stand her. I don't want to marry her. Or if she's like, please don't do this to me. I hate you. Then what he can do is he can go to the village leadership and say, I choose not to marry the woman. No one can make me. I don't want to marry her. She is at that point, under the governance of the village, and this is in Deuteronomy, to take one of his sandals off of his foot, spit in his face, and from that point on, he shall be known as the man of the unsandaled family. Which evidently was quite an insult in ancient cultures to be an unsandaled family. The insult's really lost on us today. I would like to be called an unsandaled man. I don't wear sandals very often. My toes, they don't look that good. I'm better with shoes. But, but there, was a, there was an insult in there. But it was, the idea was this. If the man didn't want to marry the woman, he didn't have to. It would be shameful. It would be embarrassing. He'd get over it. Everybody could move on. The woman was free to move on. Now, her prospects may not be very good, but they were something. And so the Deuteronomy passage here, all of these point to something called primogeniture. So you might've heard of this before, primo or primogenitor, and it's, you just kind of sound it out and you can figure it out. Primo is the first and geniture is the generation. So it's the, the idea of the first son. And the firstborn was the recipient of family leadership. Now in Isaac's household and in Jacob's household, this gets upended, partly because boys have scandalized the family and partly because there's deception involved. But it, the leadership, but not just the leadership, most of the assets of the patriarch go to the firstborn. Now, why am I bringing all this up? This is why this story gets a turn to it. Because if Onan produces an offspring with Tamar, it will be biologically his son, but also his nephew. And worst of all, the nephew is going to outrank him. His son will automatically outrank him in family leadership, 
prominence and expectation of assets. Now, for some of us, we go, well, that's nice. He still has a son. Won't his son be nice to you? I will not ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have offspring that aren't very nice to you? It does not always work out, does it? Or you have friends and they have offspring that haven't quite been great to them. Well, if you have a nephew son, he doesn't have to ever do what you tell him to do. He knows from an early age, and it quite possibly could be your sister-in-law wife telling him, you don't have to listen to that bozo. You outrank him. Imagine how pleasant that'd be when he's 12 and you're 38. Not fun. It's not fun when your own kids back talk you when they're that age or later in life, right? That's not fun at all. But now you have a kid who actually has actual power and influence in the family. And so what is Onan going to do? But Onan knew the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. Okay, we can all giggle a little bit. We can all get it, you. And right now I want you all to just say a little silent prayer to God that I was the one that had to read that out loud and not you. <laughs> it's in the Bible. There's some stuff in the Bible. It's all inspired, but it's not all as inspiring, okay? What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. So um, it's interesting, if you grew up in a Roman Catholic environment, and I'm not picking on, we don't pick on other groups or denominations, but if you grew up in a Roman Catholic environment, you might have heard about own in sin. And this is uh, one of the root verses that are spoken against birth control because you shouldn't stop the natural possibility of conceiving. But that is not the sin here. The sin isn't that he's practicing a form of birth control. The sin is Onan is disobedient to not only the law of the land, but that which gets codified later in the law. And this, there's multiple layers to the sin. We could, we could focus on the fact, it says whenever he did this. So he makes use of Tamar as a, a, a lover, but he doesn't do anything by way of provision for her. He uses her, in a sense abuses her, but does not provide for her. And he's being disobedient. He knows what he's doing. It's all very conscious. He wants to be the primogeniture. He doesn't want competition. And so he could just refuse to marry her, but he won't do that either. He doesn't want to bring shame upon himself and so the Lord strikes him down, just like the Lord struck down his own brother. And he does this over and over. And he leaves Tamar, essentially a woman who's vulnerable in a culture where your children were the safety net and the social security system, the Medicare, they're the ones that are looking after you. And now she'll have nobody to look after her. But... Onan still uses her. And so the Lord strikes him down. Well, what's uh, Judah gonna do? He's got three sons, that's good news. So maybe he gives, him the, gives a Tamar the third. No. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like the other brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. So, um, you know, we have an insight into Judah here. Um, we don't know exactly what's turning in Judah other than the fact he knows he does not want to lose yet another son. He blames Tamar for the death of both the boys. He doesn't assign any responsibility to either boy. Now that, in fairness to Judah, he may be ignorant. He may not be aware of why the boys were struck down. He might do the math and think, it's her. And so he sends her home. Now, she actually is part of his tribe. Once she married in and was passed from one son to the next, she is his responsibility. And he even tells her, look, you're still bonded to us. He said, I'm going to give you Shelah, even though I'm never going to give you the boy. And I want you to act the part of a widow, but I don't even want to feed you at my table. I don't want to clothe you. 
I don't want to comfort you. I don't want you around my compound. I want you to go home. You're now your parents' responsibility. This is, this is the original boomerang kid. She ends up back in her parents' house. And they're like, what happened? And she is to act as a betrothed woman. Judah is uh, precisely the kind of parent that always blames the in-laws. It's never his precious little kid's fault, apparently. And so she does exactly what she is told to do. But this is a no-win situation. She is trapped. She is betrothed to Shelah, a boy who, as he comes of age, it becomes evident she will never marry. But she is not free to move on. Now Judah could have said, look, I'm sorry. Both those boys died. You're a young enough woman. Go ahead. I release you from all covenanted responsibilities to our family. You may return to your home and pursue a new relationship, be part of a new family. And there might have been options for her. But he does not do that. No, in fact, he does something else. Now, after a time, it says, after a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, once again, we've, we've talked about, she does not have a name. She's just a daughter of Shua. The Lord knows her name, but we do not. When Judah had recovered from his grief, and there's an interesting just little contrast. He tells Tamar, just go home, live like a widow indefinitely. He just lost a wife that he's been with for well over 20 years, raised three sons with, grieved over two sons with, and he grieves for a period of time, and then he's done grieving as a widow while he expects Tamar to continue to grieve as a widow. And he says, um, after he'd recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Herha, the Alamite, went with him. That's the guy that was at the very beginning. So we'll just focus in a little bit on that map. That's the, the water uh, off to the right is the Dead Sea. And you can kind of see that little blue box right here, Judah and Tamar, rural symbiosis with the Canaanites. But you can kind of see these areas. And what I appreciate about the map is you got Jerusalem and you got Bethlehem. So you can kind of see these are all within a walk of each other. Jerusalem to Bethlehem, that dot to dot is somewhere around six miles. So if in your mind you want to kind of get a general kind of compass of how far places are apart, Jerusalem to Bethlehem, six miles. So all of these little Chesba, Adullah, Timnah, they're very close together. They're within a walk of each other. Well, it says, when Tamar was told, and I love that little line, homes and secrets leak, don't they? When, when Tamar was told, so evidently Tamar still got friends in the household. Don't know who it is. Maybe there's a former sister-in-law in the mix that we've never met in the story, but somebody slipped a note to her and said, after a long time, Judas, uh, when Tamar was told your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to, um, uh, to shear the sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, so she's been wearing them all these years, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, then sat down at the entrance to Enim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. So can you think of any other stories about that time, maybe a little bit before, where someone played dress up to deceive? In this family unit, it's one of the legendary stories. Jacob dons on some goat skin and puts on some smelly clothes to pretend that he is his brother Esau, which always makes me think, how hairy was Esau? I mean, that guy needed some product to help. I mean, if your arms are as hairy as a goat, we all want to see it after. Come down front. We won't judge, but we'll just touch your arm. I mean, that's some hairy brother right there. But Esau evidently was a hairy fella. And so Jacob dresses up Fool's dad, it's his mother's idea, he goes along with it. So here we have dress up again. We're pretending to be somebody different. We're at least veiling. And also what's interesting, now this is a puzzle for scholars. Because by the text, it looks like the putting on of a veil indicated she was a prostitute. However, 
in all the old ancient customs of the time, the only women who were allowed to veil themselves were married women and engaged women. Now, I think that's important because if that's true, and, and again, this is, we're dealing with bits and pieces of ancient customs, but it could very well be that the veil was just a disguise, not meaning the veil indicated prostitution. Hard to tell exactly. But if that's the case, Tamar's only shielding who she is. She's not pretending to be in that work. She's just not letting Judah know who she is. And so as she puts on this veil, she sits at literally a fork in the road, which is both a literary metaphor for so many things in life, isn't it? There's a fork in the road many times, and you can make many different choices. Well, what is Judah going to do when he sees this veiled woman? When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Now, this is where I mean, in the text, and both in ancient customs, it might mean, since he didn't recognize her because her face is covered, he thought she was a prostitute. We do not know. However, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, she went over, uh, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. What a guy. I mean, Judah is what a guy. I mean, later a nation is named after him. The whole line of David comes after him. You know, this is why I don't go on places like Ancestry.com. I don't want to find out I'm related to that guy. This is exactly why. He says, uh, come now. Let me sleep with you. He's widowed. He's lonely. What will you give me to sleep with you? She, she asks. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. Believe it or not, that was a handsome payment. That's weird, but a loaf of bread was considered a typical payment for prostitution at the time. I mean, which is, it, it's, it, it's not a main part of the text, but it, it's just a little like hit pause and note something that so many people, including Tamar, that end up in what today is called sex trade, pornography, all that kind of work, are oftentimes the most vulnerable people at the very end of a rope who have very few other options in order to survive. Almost 20 years ago, first mission trip I took to Kenya, we were, we were involved in a group that was doing church planting on islands in Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is so large, there are islands that have thousands of inhabitants. And there was an effort to plant churches on these islands. And so the group we were with had taken us by float plane onto one of these islands. And we got there and we walked all around and there were all men, but just a half a dozen women off to one side. And the missionary uh, guys that we were with said, well, they're uh, prostitutes. And I, I, somehow asked, I don't remember even asking uh, uh, the details, but I said, what do they get paid? I mean, I looked around and I saw what looked to me like a bunch of poor people everywhere. And he said, for soap, a little bit of food and soap. I thought that, that's the most awful thing, just to survive in other words. And in a sense, this is what Tamar is doing. I bring this up because I want us to always see this in light of Judah, not in light of Tamar. All too often we look at these stories and go, what a shady woman this is. This is an incredibly vulnerable woman at the end of a rope who has very few places to turn. It's not justification, but it does help us understand a thing or two, doesn't it? And so he says, uh, what, what, uh, what's the payment? A goat. I will tell you, and will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? That's a very smart move. By the way, so often when we meet women in the Bible, there, there's a lot of this wit and brilliance. We, we see it in many of the different females that have dialogue that we have preserved in the Bible. She's smart here. She is, there's a plan unfolding. She's not lonely for male companionship. She wants an offspring. So what will you give me? Because this is a big risk she's taking. What pledge should I give you? Well, your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and he slept with her. 
and she became pregnant by him, which is fascinating. She's with Ur and never got pregnant. Of course, Onan didn't get her pregnant for that main reason, but here she sleeps with Judah once. And it's just a reminder, God's divine sovereignty overrides all kinds of situations. And so she becomes pregnant and she left. When she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. So she goes, she loses the disguise. Now, um, it is worth noting the thing she asked for would be like, leave me your personal identification. Leave me your driver's license. Um, here is a, this was discovered eight years ago in Jerusalem. And this is, a, this is an impression left by the kind of marker she asked Judah for. And what's interesting about this particular thing is that eight years ago, it was found in a rubbish heap just south of the Temple Mount. And this is from the signet ring of King Hezekiah. So there's these little things from time to time archaeologists dig up that reassert uh, re, uh, the authority of the Bible. And here's one. Sometimes people say, well, there was no King Hezekiah. That's King Hezekiah's impression of his signet ring which means that this was either handled by Hezekiah or a very high-ranking official in his household. This is the kind of thing that she asked for. Not the impression, but she asked for the thing that makes the impression that Judah would have used if he was uh, signing a contract. He'd sign it and he'd make the impression in some sort of mud or wax or something like that. And so she says, leave some documentation that it was you. So... He does just that. This sounds pretty good to him. And I love this. I, this is on your, um, your little handout. This is an engraving. And here's why I shared this engraving. It is the only engraving I could find where Tamar is just in a demure pose. All, if you Google Judah and Tamar, most of the time, her chest will be exposed. Part of her chest will be exposed. She's obviously prostituting herself. Well, the Bible doesn't say any of that. It doesn't give us any reason to assume that's true. She just shielded her identity from Judah. And he comes over and he propositions her. She doesn't whistle at him. She doesn't put a little leg out. She doesn't call him over. He sees a woman at the fork in the road and just makes an assumption and he goes and he asks for sex and offers to pay for it. And I like that this artwork presents the humanity of a situation. You can check my work on it. If you Google and you look up images and artwork, some of it is a little racy, some of it's more racy. But this was the first one I could find that I was like, I can show that in church without blurring something. <laughs> And that kind of made me sad because so often we, we will sexualize these characters, which is not why they're there. And even these stories that have sexual overtones to them, that's not the main point here. That's, that's something that the modern mind gets so easily distracted on. What we need to see is a vulnerable woman who is doing what she can do. Now, incidentally, the Bible on these matters lays responsibility often at the men. Here's what the prophet Hosea said. This is much, much later. So this is centuries after this incident. And this is, uh, there's two different verses. I'm just quoting this portion, but in Hosea, Hosea 4, he is confronting the people. He says, you're sacrificing at the mountaintops and the burnt offerings on the hills. In other words, you're worshiping all the false gods, not the real God. Under oak tree, poplar tree, terebinth, where the shade is pleasant. Therefore, therefore, because you're not worshiping the right God and you're worshiping all the false gods, your daughters turn to prostitutions, prostitution and your daughters-in-law to adultery. Now, here's what's interesting. This is why I'm sharing this verse. I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery. Because the men themselves consort with harlots and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. A people without understanding will come to ruin. And it, why, why this is, I think, helpful, it's not that the women bore no responsibility, but primary responsibility was being placed on the man. And Judah is the responsible one. He's the patriarch of a family unit. He's the son of a, a man of faith. 
And when it comes to certain things, and this is one of them, even the Hittite, the later Hittite and Assyrian Empire, but even the villages knew this is not how you conduct yourself. And so, um, meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend. He doesn't go back himself. He's embarrassed himself enough, shamed himself enough. So he sends his friend back with a goat, but uh, he couldn't find her. He asked the men who live there, where's the shrine prostitute who is beside the road at Enim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitutes here, they said. They, they, that, that, that is not a part of this community, they tell him. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men said there are no, there, no shrine prostitutes there. And Judah said, well, let her keep what she has or we'll become a, a laughing stock. I mean, you can't knock on every door saying this is who we're looking for. So after all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. And so the plot thickens. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution. I added the emphasis there. And as a result, she is now pregnant. So what's Judah going to do? He asked for the most extreme measure. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. Now, the Old Testament only calls for that level of capital punishment under the most extreme measures. This isn't one of them. And so Judah has reacted with such fierceness towards her. It kind of tells us a little bit that there is a growing or a deepening or a just thorough, full-blown resentment towards Tamar. His response to her is overblown. It also tells us that his family was one of prominence because if he wasn't prominent, he couldn't have commanded, have this thing done to her. And it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating that all this reveals that Judah is acting in ignorance. He's ignorant to why Ur died. He's ignorant to why Onan died. He's ignorant to who the woman was that he hooked up with. He's ignorant that he had actually had sex with his daughter-in-law. And he's ignorant to the fact he's calling for the burning of the woman that's carrying his sons in her womb. And so he's acting out of this ignorance, but he's acting with great passion. Adam Clark, who is a, a British Wesleyan pastor and theologian of, uh, of the uh, 18th century, he has some keen insight into the drama unfolding. He says, how strange that in the very place where adultery was punished by the most violent death, prostitution for money and for religious purposes should be considered as no crime. Can you think of anything like that in our culture today? The grand hypocrisy of a situation where there's far worse things, but we attack the lesser things. Maybe it's all serious, but there is a venom towards certain things and not as much towards others. There's even complicit. Judah has absolutely no problem with sexual intimacy with the woman he pays a young goat to have intimacy with. But if his daughter-in-law has done this and gotten pregnant, she should be burned, not stoned, not taken to task, not expunged from his family, but burned. Well, the, uh, the story has an interesting turn. As she was being brought out, she sent a message. So who is it that probably goes to bring her out? It's probably men from Judah's household, most likely. So she sent a message to Judah. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. See if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. And presumably, if it's true that it was his compatriots that went and grabbed her to burn her, when she said, hey, the guy who got me pregnant, he left these things behind. And as they handled the seal, they were like, I would have loved to just seen a video clip of this moment. Because I can just picture the guy like, how dare you? Hey, uh, isn't that the boss's <laughs> signet ring? And no wonder we haven't gotten paid in a while. He, he said he lost his signet ring. I think that, you know, there was, there was an aha moment that the children, that now, 
Now, believe it or not, Tamar was acting in her right. You see, because she, she technically didn't commit adultery because Judah or Shelah would have been an acceptable spouse for her. So she stays within the family and of all things, she ends up producing, pregnant with a son or sons who become replacement sons for the deadbeat husbands she had just a bit prior. And so um, we have this, uh, this moment where Judah recognizes that he's in the wrong. And he says, she is more righteous than I. And, and bluntly, in the old language, it just says, she's righteous, not I. He acknowledges. And there is a turn in Judah that is worth noting. While we look at these people and they're complicated and they're messed up and they're broken and self-centered, with Judah, with Judah, we see something that we should appreciate because he's, he's starting to turn a little bit. And we're gonna leave him behind this week, but, but if you read on, he's the brother who later, when standing before Joseph, who's now risen to prominence in Egypt, says, don't keep Benjamin. Enslave me. Put me in your, put me in your galley. I don't care. Send the boy home. It would crush dad. There's a change that takes place in Judah. And some people, it's a lot of knocks in life before they begin to receive what God has for them. Before they begin to make that transformation that they need to make. And he says, she's the right one. Now, he's not saying, by way of saying she's righteous, he's not saying she's perfect. He, he's just saying that when it comes to the situation in which we find ourselves, she was in her right. She deserved to have an offspring, and I denied that, and now she has that. And it, weirdly enough, is by my hand, is by my doing, and she acted within her prerogative. She did have rights that Judah was denying. Well, as the story goes on, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. Two boys of Judah are lost, and now two boys are born. And Shela is the older, but he is now outranked by the baby boys. Shela is third in line. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. She was given birth. One of them put his hand out so the midwife put a little scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist. The hand must have stayed out there for a while. And then she, the, the hand kind of comes back in and another boy jets out. And she says, uh, when he drew back his hand, the brother came out. She says, oh, you, this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez when his brother who had the scarlet thread on the wrist came out and he was named Zara. And we could we could concoct from this all kinds of applications. And if we were only in a series not connected to Christmas, but only in the Old Testament, we might, we might make some applications that would be good, not main points, but could be good. For instance, we could note that Judah never mentions Tamar's name, but the narrator uses it often. That sometimes... Sometimes we feel like nobody knows us, but God knows us. We could make that as an application, and it would be true. It wouldn't be a main point, but it would be true. I mean, we could, we could say that um, God can redeem all kinds of sinful actions, and that is true. The Bible shows this over and over. This story kind of shows this, not the main point of this story. We could even... Um, Go in a darker place and say there's a, a consequence for sin. Two men died as a result of their wickedness and disobedience. Again, not a main point. So what's this story do? It moves along a greater, grander, more important story. The third verse in the New Testament reads like this. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, 
whose mother was who? Who is their mother? Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram. And so it goes all the way till we get to Jesus Christ. I heard it once said that um, the family tree of Jesus doesn't necessarily tell us how Jesus came. It shows us why he came. That in the family tree of Jesus, we see over and over that it's filled with people like us. People like Tamar, broken, forgotten, used, abused in the family tree, in the family of Christ. Or we, we see in it selfish and self-centered like Judah, who God can still use people like us. And in the family tree of Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, there are only four women mentioned besides the Virgin Mary. And all the women have some drama or brokenness or backstory. And so next week, when we gather together, we're gonna to talk about a woman who lived in the wall who married a guy in the inner circle. And so until next week, let me pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, what a great thing it is that we can come together open up your scriptures, inspired by you, that the Holy Spirit can meet us in a place like this and through teaching and through interacting, absorbing, considering, your spirit can speak to us each in a unique way. You had a message for each one of us and so Lord, let us be receptive and sensitive so we can hear it. Thank you for stories of real people, that the Bible's full of real people who lived complex, complicated, and sometimes some pockmarked sinful lives, but they ultimately point us to you. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Thank you and have a great night.